Hey guys, so apparently um, FRQ number three didn't have any sound, so we're doing uh, round two on this. Um, first thing I want you to notice is that this was a calculator problem, so that is why they didn't give you a graph, is because you have a graphing calculator. Um, you shouldn't really need a graph to sketch this though. Um, e to the x we know goes like this. Okay, so there's f of x equals e to the x. And then ln x is going to look something like this. And then uh, notice that these never cross each other, but they give me in part A, find the area enclosed by the graphs of f and g from a half to one. So that means that when I sketch my graph here, I'm going to go from, we'll say a half is here and one is here. So that's x equals a half, that's x equals one. So I really only want this space defined between those graphs, so right here. Okay, well, this is just going to be a normal integral then. Area equals integral from, then I'm going to start at a half. I'm going to go until 1. And then I'm going to go top minus bottom. Top is f of x, bottom is ln x. Okay. Then from there, I'm going to go into my calculator. I'm going to type both of those equations in. So I'm going to have um, e to the x. Oops, I want that to be my y1 because I want to kind of go in the same order that they gave them to me in. And then uh, ln x would be right there. Okay? So from there, we want to do a math 9 integral from a half until 1. Then we want our function here to be of, what is this? Okay, uh, we want our function to be, get rid of that, um, uh, alpha trace y1 minus alpha trace y2 and then dx. So 1.222229. Okay, and remember if you go to four decimal places you don't have to round so I can just drop everything after the 8 off. Okay, part B says uh, find the volume of the solid generated when the region between a half and one is revolved around y equals four. Okay, well, for part B, if I'm revolving around y equals four, you could, if you want to, make four an equation here, um, but hopefully we know that that's going to hit considerably above where our graphs are. So there's our e to the x. Okay, there's our four. Obviously, our zooming here is terrible, so I'm going to pick number six, which is standard. Oh, and my calculator died. Awesome. Um, so anyway, y equals four is going to be up here. Okay, so there's my y equals four line. Uh, hopefully, if your calculator didn't just die on you, uh, then you know that it's up there. Now, remember, the first question for uh, rotating or revolving is you need to decide if it's going to be disk or washer. Okay, since my graph is not adjacent, there's this empty space, I'm going to have two R's. So capital R is going to be the space from here to here. That's capital R. And then little r is from here to here. Now remember that both of those are going to be top minus bottom. So for capital R, the top is touching my flat line at y equals 4. The bottom of capital R is touching this graph, which is ln x. So capital R is 4 minus ln x. Little r is going to be from 4 to the top function, which was e to the x. Okay, keep in mind that capital R is from the top to the further away function. R is from the top to the closer function. Okay, then from there, we're going to do volume equals pi integral uh, from a half to 1, because those are still my x values here. And then I'll do uh, capital R squared minus little r squared dx. Okay, then from there, hopefully your calculator's not dead, and you would type that in. All right, so we are doing math nine here. We're going uh, from zero, nope, not zero, from a half to one, and then we're gonna do four minus ln x, squared minus and then 4 minus e to the x oops squared 
and then dx here. Now look back over what I did. There's something I'm missing that's going to be important. Okay, I've typed that in, but I forgot to multiply by my pi in the front, so I'm going to multiply by pi at the end. Okay, also you should not use 3.14 because remember, you got to go to four decimal places. So I got 23.6094. 23.6094. Okay, part C. Part C says, let h be the function h minus f of x. Or I'm sorry, h of x equals f minus g of x. Find the absolute minimum value of h on the interval. Find the absolute maximum value of h on the interval. Then show the analysis that leads to your answer. Okay, so I want you to think about. First thing you should notice is that absolute means that you're going to need to include a table with endpoints. Second thing you need to think about is you're not only finding a min, you're finding a maximum too. So the first step to finding a min or a max is to take the derivative. So if h of x is f minus g, that would be e to the x minus ln x, then I need to take the derivative of that. So the derivative of e to the x is still e to the x, and the derivative of ln x is 1 over x. The second thing that I need to do are find critical numbers for that. Now, there are a couple different ways to do it. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back into my y equals, and I'm going to type in h prime, because I want to just look at the graph. So I have e to the x minus 1 over x. I'm going to restrict my window to only be from a half to 1. And then I'm just going to kind of leave my y values alone, because I don't know what to expect there. Okay, there's my graph. Now, I'm going to adjust my window a little bit. If I go into my chart, see that all of these are, oh, I'm in the 60s. Um, all of my values close to like 1 and a half and all of those, okay, they're obviously much smaller. So let's see what those are. Okay, so when I'm between 1 and 2, my, my numbers are between 1 and 6 here. So my y value is 1, then 6. So I'm going to restrict my window here to be from maybe a negative 2 to about maybe 6. Okay, so now we have a good graph of that. Now, remember that I want a max and a min. So I can see that this point right here is going to be a minimum because the sign of h prime, which is what I'm looking at the graph of, changes from negative to positive. So I'm going to go ahead and find that value, second trace, 0. Then I'm going to go from 0.5 to 1. My 0 occurs at 0 0.5671. 0 0.5671. So I'm going to put my critical number, uh, set this equal to 0. Remember, that's how we find our critical numbers. x equals 0 0.5671. Okay, from there, this is a relative minimum. because h prime of x changes negative to positive. It's also the absolute minimum. It's also, let's say, where the absolute minimum occurs because it's the only relative extrema. Now, I want to point out something. I actually think when I did this video before, even though it didn't have any sound, um, I think that I forgot to finish the question. Um, so if you look at the way it's worded, normally it says find where the minimum occurs. This is asking for the absolute minimum. That means that they want a y value. So while this x value I found is where it happens, the minimum value, we need to make a table and find that still. So my endpoints are a half and one. My critical number was 0.5671. And then I need to go back and find my h of x's at each of those values. Now remember, h is this. So I'm going to find, in my normal uh, graphing window, um, e to the power of a half minus ln of a half. Okay, so that's going to give me this first value here. So that comes out to be 2.3418. Okay, then I'm going to do the exact same thing. 
e to the power of 0.5671 minus the ln of 0.5671. That gives me 2.3303. Okay, then I'm going to do the exact same thing, but just with a 1. So e to the power of 1 minus, and then the ln of 1. Okay, that's 2.7182. So looking at those values, the minimum occurs at this value, but that is the minimum. So make sure, that's why I always have you all write that full sentence, just to make sure that you don't uh, make a mistake like that. So the absolute minimum is 2.3303 at x equals 0.5671. The absolute max is 2.7 is the biggest and it occurs at x equals 1. So remember that we're guaranteed to have an absolute min and an absolute max. You're going to have to find both because they happen to ask for both. Okay. All right, let's turn the page. Next one. Okay, so uh, next one that we're going to do right here. Okay, we have the rate at which people are entering a uh, amusement park. Okay, is given by, then you have your equation. Okay, so it says, uh, part A, how many people have entered the park by 5 o'clock, which is time 17? Okay, so the first thing that I notice is it says right here that E and L are both measured in people per hour. So this is people per hour. This one is people per hour. So if I want to know how many people, the first thing that you should realize is that we're going to be doing an integral in part A. Specifically, we're going to start integrating at zero. Okay, but look carefully. Look what it says if I keep reading. These functions are valid from 9 to 23, the hours that the park is open. So I can't start integrating at zero. I have to wait to start until 9. I'm going to stop at 17. And then I want to know how many people are entering the park, so I'm only going to use my E of T, which is uh, the 15 blah 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 equation. So let's type our equations into Y equals here. Alpha Y equals N over D. Okay, then I'm typing in my equation here. Hopefully you're doing the same. Okay, so there's my uh, top equation. That's my N people that are going into the park. Then my out equation, alpha y equals n over d, is 9890 over x squared minus, oops, 38x and then plus 370. Okay, so we have both of our equations typed in here. So I'm going to second quit math 9 from 9 to 17. And then I'm using my y1 equation, dx. So it's 6,004.27. Now, notice it says round your answer to the nearest whole number. So really it's 2703. That's approximately 6,004 people. Okay? All right, go to part B. So it says the price of admission into the park is $15 until 5 p.m. After 5 p.m., the price of the park is only $11 to get in. How many dollars are collected from admission to the park on any given day? Okay, so I want you to think about this is how many people came in before 5 o'clock. So that means that all 6,004 people would have paid $15 each. Okay, plus. Then it says after 5 o'clock, the price goes down to 11 so then I'd have to integrate from 9, oh wait, sorry, not from 9, from 17 until, uh, when does my time close? It says it closes at 23. And I'm going to have to charge all of those people that entered $11 each. So I have 6,004 that came in during the $15 timestamp. But then my 17 to 23 hour people, they only have to pay $11. So I need to work out this integral, times it by 11, and then add it to this other part over here. So I'm going to do math 9, 
We're going from 17 to 23 when the park closes of our entrance function dx. Figure out how many people came in there. Now again, we're going to round to the nearest whole number. Okay, so this section here came out to be 1,271 people. So I have 6,004 people that are going to pay $15 each. Plus I have 1,271 people that are going to pay $11 each. And then all I have to do there is uh, multiply that out. So 6,004 times 15 plus, then I have 1,271 times 11. So my total cost is going to be 104,041. 104041. Now, something to think about here is that uh, we're not considering how many people are leaving because they don't get a discount based on what time they leave. So what the park makes is strictly going to be a function of how many people come and enter the park. Okay, look at uh, part C. So it says, let h of t equal the integral from 9 to t of e of x minus l of x from 9 to 23. The value h of 17 to the nearest whole number is 37.25. Find the value of h prime of 17. Then explain the meaning of h of 17 and h prime of 17. Okay, so first thing that I'm going to do is the explain the meaning of h of 17. So let's do this first. So h of 17, it tells me, equals... 37.25. Now notice that h has an integral in it. It starts at 9 and it goes until t. So that means that really h of 17 is the same as the integral from 9 to 17 e of x minus l of x. Okay, well think about e and l are both measured in people per hour. These guys count as a positive. These guys count as a negative. So basically, they're figuring out the number of people that are still in the park over that time period. Okay? So I would say this represents at time t equals 17, which we already know that's 5 p.m., but I'm not going to bother to put that. Okay? There are 3,725 3, people in the amusement park. Okay? Because I integrated how many people had come in and then I minus the integral of how many people would have left. So that's how many people are still in the park. I'm also going to put here time equals 17 hours because remember you want to check your units there. Okay, then they asked me to find some other stuff. So explain the meaning, check. We already did that. Okay, next thing that they asked me to do was to find h prime of 17. Okay, well think about if this is h of x, then h prime is going to be the derivative of this. And remember that whenever I take the derivative of an integral from a constant, which is 9, to t, I just sub out the old letter with the new letter. So I'm going to put that h prime of t is going to be the derivative of this, which is just e of t minus L of T. Okay, then it tells me to find the value of H prime of 17. Well, then H prime of 17 is going to be E of 17 minus L of 17. So, I already have these typed into my Y equals. I'm going to go to my table. I'm going to scroll down to 17 because I feel like being lazy. Oh, except that, look at, I have random like fractions and stuff here. So let me see if I can change that to be decimals. Oh, and it's still not in decimals. Okay, so never mind. I'm going to do it like this. Alpha trace y1 at 17. Boom. Answer. Alpha trace y2 at 17. Boom. Okay, hopefully your calculator is not set up however mine is, but you can fix it. Okay, so h of 17 is 380. That one's 760. So then remember, I need to do E of 17 minus L of 17. So I'm going to do this one minus that one. So I got negative 380.2814. Now, you might be wondering how this came out negative. Okay, well, let's think about it. These are both in people per hour. 
So think about, does it make sense that my h prime came out to be negative? Okay, well, what that means is that at 17, the amount of people in the park was decreasing by 380.2814 people per hour. Now, that tells me that the number of people in the park was decreasing because that rate came out to be negative. So, at time t equals 17, the number of people in the park is decreasing because it was negative at a rate of 380.2814 people per hour. Now, you might be wondering why I didn't tag a negative on this. If I said the word decreasing, then that counts as my negative. So I don't also need uh, to put a, a negative on my value. Okay? Uh, and then here, I guess I probably should put at t equals 17 hours. Okay, the number of people in the park is decreasing at a rate of 380. Okay, part D. At what time does the model predict that the number of people in the park is a maximum? Okay, well, let's go back to my graph here. Now, I have not adjusted the window on my graph, so I'm going to do that now. Um, given that my 17s are up here in the 700s, when I do my window, I'm going to go from 9 until 23, because those are the values that my equations are valid for. And then for my x min, I'm going to go from negative 500 to 1,000. Now, keep in mind, I'm just kind of guessing here. Okay, it's not like I have a magical formula to figure that out. I'm just kind of graphing my two values. Okay, so there we go. Now, I want a maximum. Remember that the first equation that was graphed, okay, if you hit trace here, I can see that I'm tracing along, it labels it at the top for you, this is y1. So in my graph, I'm going to sketch this here. Okay, this is my y1, and then this is my y2. Okay, so this is my in function, this is my out function. At this intersection, these values switch. So I want you to think about overall on this side, what's happening to the number of people in the park? It's increasing. Okay, the number of people in the park is increasing. Why? Because they're coming in at a faster rate than they're going out. Okay, now let's talk about on this side. My out graph is on top, my in graph is on bottom. Well, then on this side, the number of people in the park is decreasing. Well, if it changes from increasing to decreasing, is that consistent with the maximum? Okay, hopefully your answer is yes. So, second trace, option five is intersect. Okay, they cross at 15.7948. 15.7948. Okay, so I'm going to get another sheet of paper so that I can write that out. Okay, so for my part D, I'm going to put um, there is a relative max at x equals. 15.7948 because before this value uh, we'll say the entering people are greater than the leaving people so the number of people is increasing but changes to be decreasing at this value so that after L of T is greater than E of T. Now, that's for me to show, so then I'll put, uh, so it changes from increasing to decreasing, so it's a relative max. But in order for me to prove that it's the absolute max, remember there's one other thing you have to do. You can either do a chart, which is totally fine, or you can just state, were there any other places that these crossed? No, just at that one place. So I automatically know that's the answer because it's the only um, relative extrema. So to finish off part D, I'll put 
this is also the absolute maximum because um, there are no other relative extrema. Okay? Now, there's one other thing I want you to go back and look at. Okay, it says, at what time does the model predict the number of people is a maximum? They're asking me for a time. That is exactly what I gave them. If they said, what is the maximum number of people, then you would have had to go back and find that, kind of like we did on number one. So if I needed to know how many people, okay, consider I would have to set up my integrals, okay, so it doesn't ask this, but if it did, how many, then I would have to set up my integral from zero, I'm sorry, not zero, from nine to 15.7948. And then I would have had to do the number of people entering minus the number leaving to know how many people would have been in there. Okay, so you could set up a chart if you wanted to, but on that one you wouldn't have to because they actually don't ask for the number of people. They just ask when it happens at what time. Okay. All right, go ahead and turn the page. Okay, we are going to skip here to... Probably have time for maybe one or two more, so we're going to go to this one. Okay, this is a no calculator question. Notice they gave you an equation. It says find the area of region R. Y is 2 root X. And then it tells you this is Y equals 6. Okay, so part A, if I want area, I'd set up the integral from this is X equals 0 to X equals 9. Notice I know that from the ordered pair. And then my top function is a 6. My bottom function is a 2 root x dx. Now notice I don't have a calculator. Got to work it out by hand. So antiderivative of 6 is 6x. Oops, I don't know why I put a y there. I don't know why. Get it? Uh, okay. And then uh, if this is a square root x, that's the same as x to the 1 half. So I'm going to add 1 to that to make it x to the 3 halves. And then I'm going to divide by 3 halves, which is the same as a 2 thirds. But then keep in mind I already have this 2 here. So really that's going to be 6x minus 4 thirds x to the 3 halves. From there we're plugging in 9 and 0. So 9 times 6 is 54 minus 4 thirds. And then here I'm plugging in 9. I'm going to have 9 cubed because of the 3 on top. But then the 2 on bottom is square rooted. So square root of 9 gives me 3. 3 cubed gives me 27. 27 divided by 3 gives me 9. And then times 4 is 36. And 54 minus 36 gives me 18. Okay, then we're plugging, and also keep in mind, if you didn't know that, you leave it right there. 54 minus 30, actually, you could have left it right there if you wanted to, because this is an FRQ, so it actually doesn't matter. Okay, then F of 0, I'd have 0 and 0, which crosses out to 0. Okay, then you're going to take your two values and subtract. So the total area of my region is 18. Now, something else somebody asked me, I can't remember which class it was, can I break these into separate integrals? Absolutely. If you wanted to work it out like this, 0 to 9 of 6 minus 0 to 9 of 2 root x, okay, that is totally fine. It doesn't matter if you want to put them all together, put them separately, up to you. Okay, part E, right, but do not evaluate an integral expression that gives the volume of the solid generated by rotating around y equals 7. So in my graph, we know that y equals 7 is going to be above y equals 6. We'll say that's y equals 7. Well, then I notice I am not touching my region. That means that I'm going to have two r's. Capital R always runs from the line you're rotating around to the farther away. Little r always runs from what you're closer to to your, what you're rotating around. So there's my big R, there's my little r. 
Capital R of X is top minus bottom. On top, I see that I'm touching 7. On bottom, I see I'm touching 2 root X. Little r of X. On top, I'm touching 7. But my little short distance, on bottom, I'm touching 6. So it would be 7 minus 6, which is 1. Then remember, those are your R's. Well, then your integral for part B, volume equals pi integral. We're going from 0 to 9 still because this is dx. And then I would have done 7 minus 2 root x squared minus 1 squared dx. And then keep in mind that if you accidentally happened to um, forget the squared on the 1, okay, algebraically it doesn't really matter. If you want to square 1 out, it would have given you 1 anyway. Okay, part C says, region R is the base of a solid for each Y from 0 to 6. Now, they're giving you a hint here that instead of integrating 0 to 9, okay, I'm going to be going 0 to 6. Cross sections perpendicular to the Y axis, okay, that's another hint that they're telling you part C, we're going to be working at DY. Okay, then it says it's a rectangle, the height is 3 times the length of the base. Right, but do not evaluate an integral expression that gives the volume. So first thing I'm going to do is kind of redraw my graph down here. Okay, so this was part A. Now we're doing part uh, C. So I have y equals 2 root x, and then I have y equals 6. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is resolve this equation to be in x equals form. So if I divide by 2... I have y over 2. Then I'm going to square both sides. Square, square. That gives me x equals y over 2 squared or y squared over 4. That's the version that I'm going to use for that equation. Okay, the second thing I notice is that this line here is going to be x equals 0. This is y equals 6. This down here is going to be y equals 0 as well because that's where my shading in my region starts. Okay, then it says I want a rectangle. Okay, well, the area of a rectangle is base times height. But then they tell me that the height is three times the length of the base. So it's the base times three times the base. Well, then that's going to be three times the base squared. Okay, well, let's draw our base. It says that each of our cross sections is perpendicular to the y-axis. That means that it's running this way. Okay, here's the y-axis, so perpendicular to that is going to be sideways. That means that my base is going to be right minus left. My right side here is y squared over 4, and my left side here is going to be 0, because it's x equals y squared minus 4 minus x equals 0. So volume equals 3 integral. My base is this minus that and then quantity squared dy. Now, I can't use 0 to 9 here anymore. Remember, they tried to remind you right here. My y's are from 0 to 6. So those are my end points since they're y equals values. Okay? Then it said do not evaluate, so we are not going to evaluate. Okay, hopefully that was a good little review of some area and volume. Um, okay, last part I want to do is just to run through this last one. Okay, so it says the position at zero is two. Then it says the velocity is given by, boom, right here. So I'm going to go into my y equals, and I'm going to type that. It's going to be sine of pi over three times x. Now, it looks kind of weird on mine. If you want to, you could open up the little fraction thing. Okay, but I actually have it typed in correctly, so I'm just going to ignore it. Okay, so first thing we want to do is find the acceleration when the object at the time 4. So remember, acceleration at 4 is V prime of 4. And then remember, you do not do the derivative by hand, even though you could. You're going to do it in the calculator. So math 8, d dx, alpha trace y1, and we want it at 4. 5, 2, 3, 5. Okay. All right, go down to part B. 
So it says, consider the following two statements. Either the velocity is, is decreasing or the speed is increasing. Well, remember, in order for me to find those, I'm going to need to look at the graph. So I'm going to come into my graph here, and I'm going to look at only this little section. So from 3 to 4.5, I'm going to adjust this back to be 10 to 10 just because I don't really know what my values are going to be. Okay, so we can just barely see the graph. I see that I need to pinch my Y in more closely. So I'm going to make my Y go from negative 4 to 4 just so that I can see my graph a little bit better. Okay, so I'm going to sketch this on my paper. So for part B, I can see that my graph is going downhill like this. This is a graph of velocity. Hey, you can come in. Um, so from here, if this is my velocity, then I know that my velocity is less than zero. And I can also see that my slope of my velocity is decreasing. So I'm going to put and a prime of t, which is velocity, is less than zero. So let's think about what that means for my velocity. Um, velocity is decreasing, that's true. Okay, I can see in the graph that it's headed downhill. It has a negative slope. But then the second part says that my speed is increasing. So I'm going to put a T here for true. Okay, my velocity is below the x-axis. I can see that's negative. And then I can also see that my slope is negative. So remember that when both of those things are negative, that means that my speed is increasing. So that one is also true. No one saw that. Okay, so my conclusion would be for statement one, I'm going to put true because, and then remember, my velocity is decreasing because my graph was going downhill. So I'm going to put V prime of T, the slope of V of T is less than zero for 3.5 to, oops, sorry, from 3 until 4.5. Okay, then for statement two. That one is also true. And we're going to put because V of T and A of T, which is the slope of V of T, have the same sign. Okay, specifically, okay, V of T is below the x-axis. Are we doing anything today, Mr. Wayne? No, shh, with a negative slope. I'm almost done. I'm just trying to finish real quick, even though the ball rings. Okay. Uh, last part, part C asks for the total distance traveled. So remember that for total distance, distance can never be negative. So I need to do more than just integrate 0 to 4. That's going to be wrong if I leave it like that. Okay, remember that this represents displacement. If I want distance, then I have to put absolute value bars. Okay, remember that the integral 0 to 4 of V of T, that gives you displacement, and that is not what they're asking you for. Displacement can be positive or negative. Distance can only be positive. Okay, so from there, we're going to do that in the calculator. Math 9, we're going from 0 to 4. We're going to do alpha window. That pulls up our absolute value shortcut. And then we're going to plug in alpha trace Y1 and DX. So we're just typing that in. Oops, put your x in the right spot. Okay. So our distance traveled comes out to be 2.3873. Okay, as you can see in the calculator. Okay, then we have one more part, part D. Says what is the position of the object at time 4? Okay, well, you might say we have the position at time 0. You want the position at time 4, so part D is a version B. So I would set up the position at 4 equals the position at 0 plus the integral 0 to 4. And then remember that if these guys out here are position, then in here it should be velocity, which is the equation given. Now, question, can I use this value here in order to sub in for this? Okay, hopefully you remember, answer is no. These guys have bars, this one doesn't. So you're going to have to refigure out that integral and then add it to the position at zero. Position of zero here is two. So I'm going to have two plus 
and then I'm going to do that in the calculator. So it'll be 2 plus math 9, 0 to 4, alpha trace y1 dx. Okay, the position is 3.4323. Okay, hang on one second. So it'll be 3.4323. Okay, good job.